Tonight, the battle over boosters just hours before American a critical FDA advisory vote. And President Trump is We're reading from Habakkuk, <clears throat> chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. Whew. Okay. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing? For the earth will be feel, filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink and pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. Thank you. Jessica, thanks for reading this passage. Um, not an easy passage to read. Uh, if you were paying attention to, to where we are in our list of woes. Um, and before we jump into this, uh, just by way of reminders, we've been working our way through uh, the words of Habakkuk that God had given him and spoken through him. Um, we've been encouraging you along the way to share your questions. And I want to bring that back up because uh, many of you have sent in questions. You've, you've thought through some things or you've been wrestling through some things. And I want you to know uh, we're not unaware of those. It's not like, hey, ask your questions. We're never going to answer them. Uh, we are looking at those. And, and over the next few weeks, we're going to bring those in in different ways. And so if you have questions, if this has brought up a, a tension or a wrestle within you of like, I'm not uh, really sure what God's doing within this, um, we want to be a place uh, where you never have to come pretending to have it all figured out. But this is a place where we can bring our questions. And what we see in this book is a, a model of one of God's own prophets, a man whom he had raised up. He had questions. Uh, and so what did he do? He went directly to the source. He went to God and said, I've got some things that I need you uh, to talk to me. And God and his graciousness is responding back. But uh, if you have those questions, you can text those in. If you are someone who's like, I'm not going to text them in. Um, and you want to write those questions out on the communication card in front of you, you can drop that in the offering. Um, and we'll collect those that way as well. But I just want to continue to remind you of that. Well, this morning we are stepping into another section of, of woes, but before we jump back into these words, um, I, was, I was thinking about this passage, and as I was, I was thinking about this passage uh, and where it leads us, and kind of the, the seeds of death that are being sown in the ways of, of Babylon that we're wrestling with here, uh, it, it took me back to uh, when I was a kid playing baseball. Now, I, I will readily admit I wasn't uh, very good at baseball. I was a good fielder, but uh, batting was not my thing because uh, if you're afraid of the ball, it's not a real fun place to be. Um, you know, someone's throwing something at you, and you're like, no. Um, and so, so that wasn't a great thing for me. But I remember one, one game in particular uh, as I was coming up to bat, and I was, I was, you know, playing the mental game. I'm like, okay, here we go. You're going to do this. You're fine. Um, and I, I got up there, and I looked at the pitcher, and the pitcher's looking at me, and he just kind of cracks this half smile. Like, oh no. And he comes in and first pitch, man, just whoo, brings it in high and tight. So I've got to jump out of the way and I'm bailing out. And so now I'm trying to get back into the box and like pretending like I'm okay, but I'm not okay. I'm like, he almost hit me. So he's throwing it again and I'm just stepping out because I'm just like, I'm, I'm going to bail early. Three straight strikes and I was gone. And as I was walking off and kind of just, you know, bringing the bat behind me, like not wanting to make eye contact with anybody, I look over at the pitcher and he's just smiling, right? He's just kind of laughing. Best part was the pitcher was one of my best friends, right? And so he knew. He knew I was afraid of the ball. And so what did he do? He threw one high and tight to get me rattled. He knew my weakness, and what did he do? He exploited it. He took advantage of it in that moment. This strange thing that in the world of sports, we're totally okay with. If you're playing in an opposing team and you know someone on the other side is injured, what do you do? 
you run right at them. You're going to go and you're going to take them down. Yesterday, I was coaching my flag football team and I was exposing weaknesses left and right. And eventually, we got to this place where I think my team was starting to figure out what we were supposed to do. And really, it's because their coach was starting to figure out what he was supposed to do. Uh, but you take advantage uh, of the weakness in front of you. It's kind of this kill or be killed mentality. If a kid can't play very well, well, everyone's going to go after him. Right? And we say that and we're like, that sounds terrible. Until you're coaching and you're like, get him. Right? <laughs> go. Now, the danger of this is this exploiting the weakness of others. It doesn't just always stay on the field. It can start to creep into actually our heart and our way of life where we begin to take advantage of people around us. Or that one person who always says yes to everything, and you know it. They just can't say no. And so you're going to lean into them because they're not going to say no to you. And they're going to get done what you need to get done, even at expense to themselves. But you're going to go to them because you know. And it doesn't seem like a big deal, but we make these decisions all the time. And it's a dangerous way for us to live. See, this is the, the type of thinking that God is speaking in extreme terms to this kingdom of Babylon saying, woe to you who exploit others for your own gain. And we can kind of distance ourselves saying, well, you know, that's, that's this big systemic thing that's happening. I have no part in that. But the truth is these woes sneak into our hearts all of the time. And when this sneaks in, this exploitation, this taking advantage of the person next to us, suddenly we stop seeing the humanity of that person and we just see them as a tool to get to our own means. And when Jesus was, was stopped by one of the scribes and they could tell that he was answering questions well, in Mark 12, he was asked the question, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, and we know this passage, we've heard it many times, even if you don't come to church, you've heard this passage. The most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Jesus was reminding those listening. He was reminding us in these words of these twin pillars that are to guide our lives. That we as a people following in the way of Jesus are to have a deep love of God. And as we foster that deep love of God, that deep love of him should spill over into a deep love of others. See, Jesus was giving us clarity in this moment around the ordering of our hearts, where the priorities are to be. We love God, and by loving God, it develops a deep love for those around us made in his image. And a deep love of others is evidence of our deep love of God. Now, there, there's a, a saying, it's attributed as a, a Greek proverb that says this, Society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they shall never sit in. The idea behind this is that you are building something beyond yourself. You are planting something that you will never enjoy. And this proverb has, has caught fire for people because it sets something different than the world that we see so often around us, where people are trying to build unto themselves, for themselves, get what they need and carry on. See, the short-sighted selfishness, when we're just thinking of my need in this moment, well, it has a long-term cost to it. Last week, we looked at the cost of sowing these seeds of death as we began to make our way through the five woes that we find in the book of Habakkuk. And so today, we're going to look at two more. We'll have one more week of woe for those of you keeping track because some were like, how, how far are we going to go on this and how many weeks do I have to come and be told woe? Just, just a, a few weeks more, okay? Just a few weeks more. But the reminder here as Habakkuk has been crying out to God saying, what are you doing? God's saying, I'm paying attention. 
And this empire that's rising up, that's going to be taking over and be this, this people of power, I know the evil that they are committing. And I'm going to call out the evil and the path that they are on because it's not the path that you want to be on. And so he's reminding us, God is speaking to Habakkuk in this moment, speaking to us, reminding us there's a way of life, there's a way of death. And the Babylonians were living a life displaying the way of death. So let's look at these two woes. And I want to start by reading verses 12 through 14 together so we get the entirety of this woe uh, together. It says, Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, it is not from the Lord of hosts that people labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the earth. And so this woe begins by saying, woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Now that word woe, we looked at this last week. We remember that woe is a prophetic condemnation of one sowing the seeds of death. That when we hear that word woe, it carries with it the weight of lament and judgment. And so God is saying, and he's judging the Babylonians. He's also lamenting. He's grieving. He's saying there's no life here, so pay attention. Because God is speaking to Habakkuk, and he's proclaiming these woes against this empire of Babylon. This nation that had not yet come to its peak of power but was soon to dominate in 605 BC. But just to keep in perspective, they would be overrun by 539 BC. So this would not be a lasting empire. God was good to keep his word saying, yeah, they're going to rise up. I'm going to use them for some things and then they're going to be gone. They will not have the final word, Habakkuk. I will. And so it begins, woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Woe to the one who builds with blood. The idea of building with blood means that you are building on the backs of others, that you are building through the toil of other people and you are taking gain from it. Their work is for your gain. They're getting nothing from this. Uh, how many of you uh, remember experiencing this in group projects in high school, right? There was always one person in the group who was building on the backs of others, who contributed nothing and yet took all the credit and got the same grade as the rest of you who are working hard. Now, some of you are sitting here saying, yeah, that was me. I thought it was a brilliant move, right? <laughs> but this building on the backs of others, this exploiting others' labor for your gain is something that we see God come hard against throughout Scripture. See, God's calling out the way of the Babylonians that you're building on the backs of others. You're building in blood. What's another kingdom that we saw do this same thing? Who's another king that we saw have this same kind of posture? It was Pharaoh. Pharaoh who built his empire on the backs of the Hebrew people, God's own people, who exploited them and used them for his labor, for his achievement, for all the things that he wanted to the point where the people were crying out, God, have you forgot us? Do you not see what's going on? And what does God do? I've heard your cry. And he steps in and he upends this system and he reminds them just who he is and he frees them and he frees the Hebrew people to say there's a different way and if you're gonna live as my people and I'm your God, this is not the way in which you will live. You will not build on the blood of others. You will not build on the back of others. You will see the dignity of humanity for they are all created in my image. And so here we see again this calling out of this this building on the backs or the blood of others. And God's like, that is not the way. That's why I already rescued and redeemed my people once to show that there was another way. So woe to the one who builds a town with blood. And, he says, founds a city on iniquity. Iniquity, this word that keeps popping up as we read through Habakkuk. Remember, iniquity is kind of that junk drawer word that carries all uh, sorts of evil connotations to it, whether it's calamity, wrongdoing, injustice, deception, uh, falseness, idolatrousness. All these different things can be found in the root of this word. 
If you were to think of a place that was founded as a city of iniquity, our modern day example often given is Las Vegas, right? Where uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas because you don't need to know all the sin that's being committed in this place. A place founded on iniquity. Now, if you happen to be someone who was raised in a similar generation to me as a kid in the 80s and 90s, uh, you may have grown up with three completely uh, irrational fears. The first one is drinking pop rocks and soda, right? We all know Billy died because he did it, right? And that fear stuck with us for whatever reason and insert whatever name you were told. But as a kid, I was like, you never mix those two because it explodes in your stomach and you're dead, you know? And there's always the one kid who's like, I'm going to try it at lunch. And everyone's like, don't do it. Don't do it. Try it. Go for it. Yeah. Pop rocks and soda. The other fear was somehow being locked in a refrigerator and being suffocated thanks to an episode of Punky Brewster that scarred many children, okay? I don't know why they hid in there, but they did, and she couldn't get out, and Margot and Punky were freaking out, and I was too, because I'm like, she's going to die. Um, and as a kid, that was traumatizing. The other thing, third thing, and I don't really know the root of this one, deep fear of quicksand. I grew up with a deep fear that if I was walking and I strayed off the path and there was some sand there that I'd step into it and it would suck me in and I'd be gone. Man, I don't know why that is, but it was there. The foundation of iniquity, building on iniquity, building on calamity, building on sin, building on deception, all of these things, it's much like building on quicksand. By all appearances, it seems safe. No, you can stand on that. You'll be just fine. And by the time you realize you're in trouble, you're already neck deep and you can't get out. This is why Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, when he had the disciples with him and this crowd was around him and he's walking through what the kingdom of God was like when he finished that, he reminded that there's two foundations you can build on. And what did he say in Matthew 7, 24 through 27? He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. Now, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who has built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Again, God's warning Habakkuk in this moment. There's a path of life. There's a path of death. Jesus is saying there's two foundations to build on. There's rock and there's sand. And what we're seeing is Babylon is following the way of the puffed up, the arrogant, the greedy. They are building on sand. They are building on blood. They are building on iniquity, things that will not last, that will topple over and collapse in on themselves. These foundations will not hold. See, but the danger of building on such false foundations is that they begin to, to shape us. And when we build on those false foundations, they don't just shape us, they, they shape the structures around us. Because we start to build based on our wants, our needs, the things that we want to get, the things that we want to receive. And so when we do this, then suddenly everyone becomes a tool for or an impediment against our wants and our desires. This is how we get to a point where having a child becomes inconvenient to our career or to our life stage. So instead of carrying the child to term, we, we kill the child. This is how when marriage just it feels hard and, and I know I committed to this person and I said I'd love them forever but it seems really inconvenient and so divorce just becomes normal. This is how we get to a space where I, I'm not really getting the, the sexual desire that everyone's telling me I deserve and so I can look for that wherever I want and so if I need to go and search online and find some porn, that's no big deal because I'm just, I, who does that really harm? That's not really affecting anyone. Or I've been hanging out with this group of friends and now they're not really my jam, but rather than walk through that interpersonal conflict, you know, I'm just going to peace out and kind of ghost them and, and they, they're going to text me, but they're never going to hear back from me because it's just easier to disappear because I don't want to deal with anything uncomfortable. And herein lies the danger and deception of the seeds of death and the foundations of blood and iniquity. When we build on those things, they will not stand. Because it redefines things. 
A human being is no longer a human, uh, an image bearer of God. No, now they're seen as a commodity or a tool or a thing or simply a means to an end. When we talk about these things, we can bring up uh, conversations around human trafficking and we can all instantly cringe that this is a reality that people experience, that young girls are sent into sex slavery. And we think, gosh, that's so horrific. I'm so glad that doesn't happen here. And yet we know that Sacramento is an incredible hub, an underground place where that's happening right now. And we hear that and we go, well, again, that's kind of big. I don't know what part I have in that. I don't know that that really affects my life. And yet we contribute to it in different ways. One of the statistics that's been on the rise, and not just because of COVID, but COVID didn't help it, is pornography use. And I bring this up because we always kind of talk around pornography around like this male issue of pornography. What's, what's frightening is that it's not just a singular demographic anymore. I was talking with a counselor friend of mine earlier uh, last week, and she was saying what she is seeing in men and young men and women and young women, that pornography is on the rise, that it's become this coping mechanism. It's this outward thing that we do just to kind of deal with the stress and the anxiety of our lives and to meet the needs that we need and our wants and our desires. See, but the danger of that is what you are filling your mind with, the havoc that that creates in your own heart. That's one thing. But the exploitation that's happening in that, it's contributing to a system that is oppressing and exploiting people. It's what's helping to fund and fuel this human trafficking that we so cringe at. And yet we participate in that, not realizing we're partaking in a system that is leading and sowing the seeds of death. But I'm just looking at porn. It's not harming anyone. Yes, it is. It's harming you and it's harming those that are in that industry. It's all enmeshed together. And it's a foundation that if you try and step on, it is quicksand. It will, it will sink you down faster than you can imagine. So woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Verse 13 continues, Behold, it's not from the, is it not from the Lord of hosts that people labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing? The Lord of hosts. This can also be translated the Lord Almighty. But here suddenly we see this language shifting. The Lord of hosts, the, the Lord who is hosting his army, his angelic army that's with him. The one who's over all things. He's gearing up for battle. And why? Well, Babylon has been cruising through all of the earth, decimating populations, going to war with other kingdoms. And it's not just these kingdoms now they're at battle with. No, the way in which they are living is bringing death and destruction wherever they go. And now they are at war with the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts. And what he's crying out in this moment, he's saying, is it not from the Lord of hosts that people's labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing? What he's warning Babylon of in this moment, he said, you are trying your hardest to maintain your power. You're trying your hardest to labor just to fuel your passions, your desire, just to bring fire and warmth to your families, to, to just do what you need to do. And yet all of your labor is in vain and it is nothing. Your labor is all aimed at your own end. And it does not justify the means. And so what God is warning here is your toil, your toil and your labor. It's as Solomon the wise once said, it's a, it's a vapor, it's a mist, it's a vanity. It's nothing. Two theologians, Bailey and Barker, once said this. They said, all work not serving God's purposes is futile work, good only for the flames of history forgotten. Just read that again. All work, not serving God's purposes, is futile work, good only for the flames of history forgotten. What they are speaking to is a life lived fully for your own aims, your own power, your own influence, your own wants, your own desires will be a life soon forgotten. The Apostle Paul spoke to this and, and the foundations that we're to build on in our lives. In 1 Corinthians 3.11, he says this, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 
Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day, that judgment day, that day we stand before him, will declare it. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work and what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through fire. What Paul is saying here is we all have a choice of what we're going to build on and what we're going to build for. And the things that will last are the things of the Lord. That's our aim. That's what we should be directing ourselves to on this path and sowing the seeds of life in him. Now, there's a danger to the statements that I just read, to the verse and to the statement before I know, because we can start to think the only work worth doing is anything attached to the church. That's the only place that you can live this out. I've heard pastors kind of present it like, you know what, I am like, I'm at like the peak of existence because of what I do, right? And here's the thing. What this is pointing us to and what God is revealing to us is that we as image bearers of God Wherever we are can work to his glory. Whatever we do, word or indeed, we do it all to the glory of him. And so you may be in a place, in a job where it is just a toxic culture environment. And God has specifically placed you there as an outpost of the kingdom so that you can live and model something different. So that the backbiting will stop with you because you're like, that's not who I'm going to be. And I'm not going to perpetuate this system of brokenness because I know there's a better way. So I'm going to start sowing seeds of life now. The work that you're doing, you're going to do it with excellence. Why? Because your boss, well, you want to please him too, but really, you want to please your ultimate boss, who is God, who is looking at the work you're doing and everything as an act of worship unto him. So wherever you find yourself, you are an outpost of the kingdom, living within that and moving yourself towards the purposes of God for his glory and for the good of those around you. This is the opportunity before each of us. Because God and what he's been moving in is not less of God in human history. No, he's moving towards more of himself in human history. I know in moments we hear that and we're like, well, it doesn't feel like it. It seems like there's a whole lot less of him. But God is moving towards the fullness of his presence, overflowing the creation. Verse 14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God's purpose is that all would know him. That he's, he's making that possible through Jesus. He's overcoming all barriers that all can know him. It's been clear from the beginning that God has created us to have relationship with him. And this word here, uh, this idea of being filled with the knowledge The knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Knowledge here is not just this acknowledgement, like, oh yeah, I know of that. No, knowledge is a weighty word that means there's an intimacy. There's a knowing of one another. There's a back and forth. There's a reciprocation of relationship that you know deeply the Lord and he deeply knows you. And so there's a knowledge of the glory glory of the Lord. This word glory, kabod, kabod, it carries with it this idea of weight. If you have a glass that is full of water and you drop a rock in it, what happens? It spills over, right? Because the rock displaces it. There's a weightiness to God's glory that when he shows up into a room, he displaces all the other uh, glory in the room. Suddenly everyone's paying attention to his weight because he's so other. This is why we see the prophets when they encounter God, they drop down as though dead because his holiness, his otherness is so thick and so present. Isaiah would cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, because he was so other, so distinct, so different. This is what God is proclaiming is coming, that this fullness will be there. Now, here's, here's kind of the bonus. Okay? The, the weightiness of God is going to display the earth, and yet we get to enjoy the, the first fruits of that now where his spirit resides in us and his presence resides within us. What a gift that we have been given. But here God is saying, my purposes are clear. My my glory will not be thwarted. The way of Babylon will not have the final say. So again, woe to the one who builds in blood. Woe to the one who founds a city in iniquity. Woe to the one who labors towards their own gain. For this is a chasing of the wind. 
Blessed is the one who builds a foundation that will last. So this is the the third of the five woes. Now we look to the fourth woe, the final woe that we'll look at this morning. And reading it all together, beginning in verse 15, it says, Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at all their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them for the blood of man and the violence to the earth, to the cities and to all who dwell in them. As we've already seen, Babylon was known for their love of strong drink. And here we see this, this phrase that you are, you are drunk, you're making them drunk, but also this, this posture that they have is both literal and, and metaphorical for they are literally drunk, but they're also metaphorically drunk on their own power, their own influence, their feeling that they cannot be overcome. And so the image that we have here in verse 15 where it says, woe to him who makes his neighbor drink and you pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze on their nakedness What this is speaking to was a practice of the Babylonians. When they would grab neighboring officials of places that they were were taking over and they were uh, dominating, they would bring in the ambassadors and they would host these elaborate parties. And part of what they would do in those parties was they would get those ambassadors drunk. And as they got them drunk, they knew that their inhibitions were at a lower level and so they could make them do shameful things, terrible things, unspeakable things. And they would hold this over them. They would gaze upon their nakedness, mocking them for that, using this sense of shame as a way of further controlling a people that they were dominating. And so here we see that this nation of Babylon is is using exploitation, manipulation, and shame to keep the the oppressed ones down, to keep their, their foot, so to speak, on the neck of their opponents. Now again, we read this and we're like, well, I'm not a king. I'm not a queen. I'm not over all this. I'm not an ambassador. This doesn't really seem uh, like this is going to affect my way of living. See, but that's the danger in this when we allow it to stay out there and we don't see the ramifications of our own actions and the own ways this seeps into our hearts. Because I've seen the devastation of moments where people are, are taken advantage of are inebriated to a point where people expose or take uh, advantage of that situation or where someone manipulates a situation and now uses it against that person to hold control over them. I remember so vividly sitting with a family with two parents that were grieving the loss of their teenage daughter who had taken her own life. She had made a decision to send a picture of herself to her then boyfriend in high school because that's just what she thought was expected of her and that was what she was told she had to do. That picture she took of herself was sent to her boyfriend who then passed that on to other people. The shame and the embarrassment and the weight of what she took on she couldn't bear and she saw no other way out than to take her own life the weight of this moment that still weighs on the boy who lives. See, again, we think we can keep our arms length at this and yet it creeps into us. There's moments where we make decisions that just seem to meet our needs and yet they have devastating consequences. Something that's become far too normal within our students' lives. These pressures of pictures and things they send back and forth to each other that they don't realize how much damage can be done in this moment until it's too late and they see no hope of redemption. See, this is the result of building on blood and iniquity. This is the result of exploiting those around us for our own ends, our own means, our own amusement. Babylon, who had become drunk with power and wine, they were living the way of death. And those who follow in that way will experience death. But we have been called to a way of life Paul reminds us in Ephesians 5.18, he says, do not get drunk with wine for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. 
Be filled with the Spirit of God. His very presence that resides within us should be overflowing. If you want to be intoxicated with something, be intoxicated with the Spirit of God. Let that overflow and course through your veins so that wherever you go, you are acting as that outpost of the kingdom. And His power, His goodness is flowing through you. Because just as the whole earth will be filled with his glory, we who stand on this side of the cross of Christ and what he has done, we can now experience the fullness of the spirit who lives and overflows in our lives, empowering us to live for his glory and for the good of others, sowing the seeds of life. This is the invitation. This is the opposite of the woes. You do not want to live this way. You want to pull towards this way. And God is pleading with these people, don't follow this pathway because there's nothing but destruction waiting for you. Verse 16, you have, had, you, you have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. God's saying everything's going to be reversed on Babylon. Where once they are so proud of their glory, they're going to feel utter shame. Where once they were drinking and getting others drunk to the point where they could expose their nakedness, no, now they're the, going to be the ones that are exposed. And what does it say? And I know sometimes this language is like, well, this is getting uncomfortable. But what does it say? Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision, right? Can one of you guys in the back just tell me what circumcision is? I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Circumcision was an external sign of those who were following and obedient to God, that were living a life that was in worship to him. And so what God is saying here is they will be exposed and they will be exposed that they are not living in my way. They are not experiencing the goodness that I've invited them into. They are actually pursuing the complete opposite of this. And the cup of the Lord's right hand, the cup is God's wrath that will be poured out to them. His right hand is his right hand of power. And instead of experiencing glory, they're going to experience utter shame. God is not messing around here with Babylon. He's making it very clear what the end of them will be. Verse 17, the violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them for the blood of man and the violence to the earth, to the cities and all who dwell in them. We see the violence and the blood and all that they have wreaked havoc on. But there's this violence that it speaks to that was done to Babylon or to, to Lebanon. And it's not just to the people of Lebanon, but it was actually a depletion of all Lebanon's resources. In scripture, we read that Lebanon was known for the cedars of Lebanon. That it was something that was used to build ships, to build palaces, to build temples. That it was this resource that people took from. And Babylon came in and decimated. They exploited it. They used it to their own gain so that no others could enjoy the fruit of that after. I remember I was, I was standing in a park in the midst of Cambodia and I was looking out at, at just what seemed kind of like an endless view of just stump after stump after stump after stump and just swampland. And I remember asking, what, what happened here? What, what am I looking at here? And the person with that, that I was with began to share with me that once there was a forest that was used for building materials and all sorts of things, that this is, it was thriving and it was great. But because of, of what Cambodia had experienced over the years from just the corruption of their own government to the genocide of the Khmer Rouge and all that was just overturned, the poverty of that country, they needed a quick fix and China was all too willing to help. And so they came in they said, you know what, we'll buy this forest from you. At little cost to China and a great game to them and, and, and little help to Cambodia and long-term decimation. And so they came in, they took all the property and all the, all the forest and they took all the goods out of there and now, years later, all you see is destruction. Exploitation and action right in front of my eyes going, ah, this is what it looks like. When you sow the seeds of death, it doesn't just matter for a day, it lingers. It has a, a lasting effect. But again, we see that and we go, well, that's something happening at a larger scale. But this is something that still happens at smaller scales when we take advantage of our, our neighbors next to us, the people in our own community. And this is what God is calling out in these woes. Woe to you who live this way. Woe to you who do not build on the right foundation. Woe to you who build on the backs of others. Woe to you who build in iniquity. Woe to you who build to the great shame of others. His call is for us to build on that which is lasting. 
And so we hear these woes and we, we kind of kick back against them like, okay, I don't, I don't want to hear this, but what do we do? Where do we take this? How do we apply this? How do we step into this and live different than what's being presented? Well, where do we begin? What did Jesus remind us of? That we're called to first and foremost have a rightly ordered heart where we love God and we love others. Jesus showed us this in the very way in which he lived. He entered into a world system that was broken, where power was absolutely being misused, where people were being taken advantage of, where where people were being used and abused. And yet when Jesus stepped in, he was present to the human beings in front of him. Now, do you remember Jesus' reaction when he came up to the temple and he saw the system in place of those coming to bring their sacrifices and they were being taken advantage of and and the money changers were making a little bit extra profit? What did Jesus do? It's one of my favorite moments where he sees what's going on and he goes and he just starts to quietly make a whip, right? Always the question that I would love to know the answer to is like, what were the disciples doing in this moment? Because they're watching Jesus and he's just slowly like, what are you doing? He's like, making a whip. And you're like, okay, what are you going to do with it? We'll wait and find out. You know, they're like, are we arguing about who is the greatest again? We're like, whoa, is it, is it us? You know? But he goes in and what does he do? He overturns the tables because he's like, this is not what this is about. This place is not going to be a place where you are abused and taken advantage of. I think one of the things I grieve so often is how many people still experience abuse and in, in places like this. People that have walked away from the church because they just can't do it anymore. They don't see the hope in it or, or someone abused their power over them and forgot that it's not about a person, it's about Jesus and what he's doing. And Jesus wouldn't stand for it, so he flipped those tables. He's like, this is not it. There is a better way for all of us. And still, In this broken system that he stepped into, he willingly was broken for our sake so that once and for all he could upend this system for good, that death would not have the final say, that our sin and our sorrow and our shame would not own us any longer, but by his blood we are owned by him, we are co-heirs with him, we have life with him, that we can step into a different path and sow seeds of life instead of experiencing the death that so easily comes around us. See, in his death, he brought life and meaning. So whether you have been taken advantage of and you bear the wounds of that or whether you bear the memories of taking advantage of others, whether you have participated in shameful acts or whether you've had shameful acts against you, What God is speaking to is that we're not moving away from less of him, but to more of him. And he has come and he has revealed himself. And your redeemer has come and redemption is possible. That there is a way of life that is found in him. And when we look at the broken system of our world, it can seem so overwhelming and so impossible. Where do we even begin? How do we even start? How do we kick against the way of death and pursue the way of life? And my encouragement to you this morning is to start where you are. Start with the people who are around you. Start paying attention to the human beings that you interact with on a daily basis. Instead of throwing our hands up and being like, well, that's just the way these engines of exploitation work in our world. No, be a presence of benevolence and kindness because that's what you've received from your father who is a good king. Instead of letting shame win the day, let us honor the image of God and those around us and let us treat people with dignity. See, if you've been wounded, I know it can be hard to risk loving again. It can be hard to lean in and really trust these words. That's why I look at the example of Jesus and I marvel. 
that he gave his very life so that even his enemies, even those calling for his death, may have the possibility of life in him. When we were enemies with him, he came for us. He broke through that wall of hostility. And he said, you, you see no possibility, let me show you the possibilities of life in me. So, so what I'd encourage you to do in taking steps where you are is begin with a simple prayer. Just ask God to grow your heart again. God, in my love of you, I want to be obedient to you. I want to worship you. And so I want to begin to love those around me again. And just think through, how can you begin to act in love towards those around you and not for your own gain? Not so that you can share the story of all the nice things you did for these people. Man, there's a trap there, let me tell you. So often in my own walk with people, I get invited in these moments that just feel so sacred to me. And I'm walking along with people in their pain and God's just moving in their life and there's still this part of me that wants to like, when talking to others, be like, man, and did you see how good I showed up there? That was pretty awesome, right? But that's not what this is about. It's not about sneaking into the conversation of like, do you see how well I just helped that person? No. It's actively fighting against that actually. That moment when you feel that bubble up, man, that's the exploitation coming to your heart. That's the seeds of iniquity that wants to grow. And you just, you just stop and you say, Lord, I didn't do this act of kindness for the glory of man around me. I did it for you. And so if just you know that, that's okay. That's an act of obedience. That's an act of worship unto him. But how can you start showing up for those around you? How can you start to love those around you? And some of you, I know you're in a situation where you have lots of people that are very hard to love around you, where it feels almost impossible, where you start to see them as just not even a human being anymore, but just the sum total of their actions so maybe you just need to start by saying, Lord, would you help me to see their dignity again? Would you help me to see that they're human? Would you help me to see that they're created in your image? And would you just start cracking my heart open just a little bit so I can show up and shine a light of your love? Because it's not going to be possible in just my own strength. You are going to have to flow through me on this one. God, help me enlarge my heart so that I'm not just constantly building a kingdom unto myself or trying to fulfill and satisfy my own needs. So my prayer for us is that in our love of God, may our love for others grow. And may our love for others be an act of obedience and worship where we are sowing the seeds of life and living to the glory of God the God who has redeemed us in Christ Jesus. Will you pray with me? Father, we, um, we so often overlook the weight of who you are, your glory and your goodness. Father, there's moments where we need to just sit with that. God, for those in this room who, who feel the seeds of death being exposed, would you warn them? Would you warn us that there's no life there? Would you redirect us? Would your spirit, Father, call out those things that we need to put to death in our life to turn back towards you? Lord, for any in this room who, who have yet to step into life with you, to experience the forgiveness and freedom that comes but feel like they are just the sum total of all, all the shame and and poor choices they've made in their life, but that you offer something different. Lord, I pray that you would speak to them now, grab hold of them now. Would they see that, Jesus, you are true? You are a rock that is firm, and we can stand with both feet firmly upon you. 
Lord, for those who just feel like they're giving up, like they just can't step into the world around them because it's just too chaotic and it's just too overgrown, would you remind them just who you are? That you are not done. That you are still moving and you are still active and you are still alive. And if there's breath in our lungs, then we are not done. And so God, would you use us to be an outpost of your kingdom, shining light to your glory. Jesus, we, we need you. We need your spirit to empower and fill and move within us. So God, we ask that you would. And not so that we can point to ourselves, but that we can jump up and down pointing to the goodness of who you are. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we conclude this morning, uh, I just want to invite any of those who need prayer. And we'd love to pray alongside you. If you don't want to come up, you can write your prayer request as well and drop that in the offering box. And we'd love to pray alongside you throughout the week as we do. If you need a Bible, we've got those. If you want to know who Jesus is, we'd love to talk to you about that. And I, I just ask this this uh, evening, or early afternoon actually, the, the pastoral team, we're getting away for a couple of days. Um, and we're going to go and... and, and pray and just listen to what the Lord has for us and look towards uh, what's coming in 2022. And um, I just would really appreciate your prayers around that time together, uh, that it would be fruitful, um, but, but also the Lord would, would move. Um, and we'll, we'll report back on that uh, next week. But as we leave from here uh, today, I want to read these words from Galatians, Galatians 6, 8, for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are within the household of faith. As you leave from here today, may God's goodness spill over you into all those around you for his glory and for the good of others. May you know his grace and may you experience his peace. God bless you. We'll see you next week.